This is the Tom Hartman Program. And welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. It's uh, 17 minutes past the hour. And Mark in Seattle, Mark Taylor Canfield. Hey, Mark. Hey, Tom. Good talking to you again. I wanted to uh, talk to you about press freedom in the United States. I know last year I talked to you about this subject, and it ended up in a video that was featured on YouTube. What I was talking about then was the Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index, which had ranked the United States as 41st in the world in terms of press freedom. Well, this year, I and my colleagues are doing what we can to uh, give an audience for progressive media, and I'm now vice president of Democracy Watch News, which is a a whole new news organization that we're forming around this issue. But I wanted to let you know... That this year, of course, the United States has dropped once again on the Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index. So last year we were 41st when I talked to you. This year we're 43rd. And that has to do with, of course, a lot of the attacks on the uh, on journalism in the United States coming from the Trump administration, at least rhetorical attacks. Right. Now, thank goodness we have the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, which actually does protect – Uh, reporters in this country, but there is no federal shield law guaranteeing our right to protect our sources and other confidential work-related information. So that's a big issue. And we've also got a lot um, more prosecution or persecution of journalists like we saw Amy Goodman. from. She was arrested at Standing Rock last year. Democracy Now is her show. Yeah, Dave Schulzberg, an Emmy Award-winning journalist, was facing 45 years at one point, more than Edward Snowden at one point, because she was there documenting some protest activity near Standing Rock where some of the protesters tried to damage the, the drilling equipment. So she was charged with a conspiracy because she happened to be a journalist there that witnessed it. Yeah. So Same I thing happened here in D.C. Like- with the Catalina of, of uh, people uh, down near where the Black Bloc guys were participating. Um, they they snared several reporters, and um, I don't know if the reporters are still facing charges. I know the one that I personally knew no longer is. Some of them are. Most Nate, of them are. Nate says most of them still are facing charges. And they're looking at 20, 25, 30 years in many cases. I mean, this is, to the best of my knowledge, the first time anybody in D.C. has been charged with felony, uh, you know, riot and conspiracy simply for being in the neighborhood of people committing crimes. Yes, and this is a, a, a legacy that a lot of journalists have been arrested for covering various protests around the country, and several are still facing criminal charges. It's an issue also sometimes, Tom, of po- what I call political persecution, because if you listen to some of the statements that came from the county sheriff's department there at Standing Rock, uh, the sheriff himself had made statements that he thought that Amy Goodman's reporting was biased. In other words, he didn't like the way she was covering the water protectors issue. So when you have police officers actually making public statements before uh, the the journalists are arrested, it shows their bias and it shows that there is a political persecution going on here. It's because of the point of view of the journalists. Right. Rather it also than empowers the vigilantes. Yes. And that's, that's a, a growing problem, particularly the vigilantes in social media. Um, it's, a, it's a tough one. Mark Taylor Canfield, keep up the great work, my friend. Good talking to you, Mark. We'll be back. with Free Speech TV. Your support, whether through giving donations, volunteering, or spreading the word about Free Speech TV, has made it possible for the only independent progressive news network to exist. And for that, I want to say thank you. Here right now. We have to get very, very tough on cyber and cyber warfare. America, this is the dispenser of fairness. This is the unfiltered truth. 
This is Norman Goldman. Did that give you a hint of anything we spoke about in the first hour? Gosh, I don't know. Well, he never knows, but thank you so much for being with me here in the second hour where justice is served every day. The Norman Goldman Show, and it's Friday. It's always a good thing. Getting late into the day. I know the weekend is here and people are getting burned out on Donald Trump, but hey, hashtag no short attention span. Uh, this is the dispenser of fairness. This is the unfiltered truth. This is Norman Goldman. Hey, Mark, you, me, and Mrs. Jones were on the air together. Hi. Hey, Norm. Good stuff today. Thanks so much for putting some of these news stories into context because I think that's something that's sorely missing in the U.S. media most of the time. So somebody's got to do it right. Might as well be you. Thanks. Thank doing you. my best. Appreciate it. Well, I'm talking to you from beautiful Seattle, up here in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, where we're a bubble of progressive politics in the United States. Um, I'm doing the MTC report now over at YouTube. I've got my own YouTube channel, and that's getting pretty popular. I'm also been, I've been appointed vice president of Democracy Watch News, which is a global news service that tends to focus in on pro-democracy movements around the world. But I'm very concerned about what's happening with press freedom in this country because our ranking on the Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index has dropped yet again. So the U.S. is now ranked 43rd in the world in terms of freedom of the press, with Norway ranked as number one and North Korea ranked dead last. No surprise there. But uh, our nation's ranking has been dropping steadily since about the year 2000, and there's several factors. Uh, there's a number of factors, including the monopolization of the media by a small group of mega media conglomerates, and you can blame the Republicans on the FCC for that continuing policy. I've actually testified before the FCC, and I know what that's about. They've denied some of their own commissioned reports on the negative effects of corporate media consolidation. Also, the U.S. has no shield law for journalists to help us protect our sources or important information that's a basic part of our reporting. So that's a big issue with groups like the Committee to Protect Journalists and Reporters Without Borders. And then, of course, you got journalists being arrested at protests uh, in Washington, D.C., and being charged with felony writing charges, which is ridiculous. You are and fake news. That, the uh, treatment of the yeah, then you, the and you, yeah, there treatment. you go. You are fake news. There you go. Yeah, no press briefings by the president. Um, the press is treated like pariah. They are are not allowed to practice their profession uh, in the way that the United States Constitution's First Amendment guarantees. Um, thank. God for that. Thank God that we have the First Amendment. Well, the Norm, administration. I can't imagine where we would be without it. This administration is more openly hostile and more aggressively nasty to the media than Richard Nixon even was. I mean, it's, it's astounding. I mean, Donald Trump has such a long enemies list, it must be a novel by now. I mean, <laughs> he just thinks that everyone is against him. He's so paranoid. And the fact that you start uh, off with this attitude that's adversarial towards the press, I mean, obviously, he didn't learn anything from John F. Kennedy, who would trade jokes with the press and get them on his side. And pretty soon, you know, they had a good relationship going there. Donald Trump is never going to have a good relationship with the press because he openly hates them and he openly makes fun of them and discounts their... But Mark, let, 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 me, let me offer another perspective here, which is the media, and I, I mean CNN and MSNBC and all of them, gave Donald Trump way outsized coverage when he was doing that Absolutely. birther thing. Ah, you said the magic word. Absolutely. And and so uh, that was disgraceful and disgusting, and they helped give him a stature and built him up. Then during the campaign, when he'd call into the shows and they'd give him all this exposure, to my mind, they really should, in to a very large degree, blame yourself. I mean, they helped create this monster. He's wonderful for their ratings. Even now, look at the, I mean, they're, they're counting the money up in the suites there at NBC. They're pumping money out of CNN. Mark, all of this pro wrestling stuff, literally and figuratively with Donald Trump, is making their ratings skyrocket. So, you know, 
they're going along with this for their own commercial reasons. Let's not let's not label them as downy innocents. Although lately, now that Donald Trump's gone too far, now they are fighting back, and it's nice to see. But now that they feathered their nest, uh, the media consolidation one that you mentioned, I think, is the big issue here because there's been so much media consolidation now that it's very difficult to get other voices out, and that's why I'm glad our friend. Mark Taylor Canfield is out there on the internet. There's a lot of other folks. I mean, this is why we got Watch It News. We need to do more journalism, and we're going to need more independent journalism like Mark Taylor Canfield. Anyway, thank you, Mark. We're back with Senior Legal Analyst Time next with Justice is Served. Hi there, and I always appreciate it when you join me right here on our stream at normangoldman.com, and there's video, of course, as well. We've been trying to get people to listen on their smartphone, to do podcasting, to stream through computers, because we knew what was coming. We knew we weren't going to be able to sustain this radio show on so many radio stations, and we knew that because two giant corporations that are dominated by Republicans own the bulk of the airwaves, and they're not going to give us access. The little group of stations we have are owned by independent companies and one of the two big companies, but... It is more important now than ever that we take advantage of the new technology, which isn't so new anymore, to end run these two old giant companies that are both on the verge of bankruptcy themselves. So please think about the different ways that you can access our show. You're listening somehow right now. How are you doing that? There are alternatives to that. Not only can you stream live through a smartphone and you don't need an app, all you have to do is use the smartphone browser, right? Whether it's Internet Explorer, Google Chrome, or Safari, listen to all kinds of material free and commercial free at the same website. Whether you're on a smartphone or a tablet, whether you're listening live or delayed, we've got to find ways around radio stations if we're going to survive. I appreciate you using the new technology with me right here where justice gets and what they're changing into. I'm out of the prediction business, but it seems that the Republicans don't know who they represent anymore. And so we discussed that in the first hour. We have senior legal analyst time right now. But if you missed the first hour, I packed a lot of stuff in there. It was very busy. Of course, Donald Trump, the entire corporate media is all about Donald Trump. Oh, and the meeting with Putin. I did my obligatory coverage of it. I think the whole thing is ridiculous, frankly, because the, the, these two guys meeting, it, it, so what? And, and the key is they met with people who aren't going to leak any information. It was too small a group. So I don't know what they talked about. They're coming out saying this is what happened. You've got a dispute between them right now. It's 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 irrelevant. It's it's like soap opera stuff. What's key is are we lifting the sanctions on Russia? If not, let's talk about something else like the hacking, right? Donald Trump is the beneficiary of hacking, and he has done nothing, nothing about getting tough on cyber. We have to get very, very tough on cyber and cyber warfare. You know, he said that during the campaign. We got that something. clip. That was we got to get tough the on the cyber. Whatever that cyber is, we got to get tough on it. Yeah. We have to get very, very tough on cyber and cyber warfare. We got to get very tough on cyber. He's not getting tough on cyber, I think it's fair to say. George W. Bush could do that. Math death. Oh, by the way, speaking of math death, we also covered the jobs numbers. Big jobs report today, 222,000 jobs. Earlier months revised upward. It's obvious the Obama economy just continues to roll along, right? Donald Trump is the beneficiary in his early months of the economy he inherited. We are making, in my humble opinion, we are making tremendous progress. Welcome back. Tom Harvin here with you. I am going to read to you from War is a Racket by General Smedley Butler as we go through the day. He joined the uh, U.S. Marine Corps. He rose to the rank of general. He was awarded two Congressional Medals of Honor, one for the capture of Veracruz, Mexico in 1914, one for the capture of Fort Revere, Haiti in 1917. In 1919, he won the Distinguished Service Medal. Uh, he retired on uh, October 1st, 1931. He was, at the time of his retirement, the most famous, the most well-decorated American soldier in history, with the possible exception of George Washington. And uh, uh, he uh, died in 1940. And in 1935, four years after he retired, he published a book. He, he wrote it in 33. He published a book called War as a Racket. And it's a small book. 
and it's out of uh, it's out of copyright, so you can buy it from dozens of different publishers. Uh, the version I'm reading from is uh, published by Aristius Books, and I just wanted to share little pieces of it with you. Keep in mind, this is from a warrior. War is a racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses of lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of the people. Only a small inside group knows what it's about. It's conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. In World War I, he wrote this before World War II, so he refers to it as the World War. In the World War, uh, World War I, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted their huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their tax returns? No one knows. How many of these war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless, frightened nights ducking shells and shrapnel and machine gun bullets? How many of them parried a bayonet thrust, thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Out of war, nations acquire additional territory if they're victorious. They just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the self-same few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill. And what is this bill? This bill renders a horrible accounting. Newly placed gravestones, mangled bodies, shattered minds, broken hearts and homes, economic instability, depression and all its attendant miseries, backbreaking taxation for generations and generations. For many years, as a soldier, I had a suspicion that war was a racket. Not until I retired to civilian life did I fully realize it. Now that I see the international war clouds gathering as they are today, I must face it and speak out. And uh, then he continues. Uh, did it, uh, let's see here. Ah, here we go. He says, yes, they are getting ready for another war. Why shouldn't they? It pays high dividends. But what does it profit the men who are killed? What does it profit their mothers and sisters, their wives and their sweethearts? What does it profit their children? What does it profit anyone except the very few to whom war means huge profits? Yes, and what does it profit the nation? Take our own case. Until 1898, we didn't own a bit of territory outside the mainland of North America. At that time, our national debt was a little more than a billion dollars. Then we became internationally minded. We forgot or shunted aside the advice of the father of our country. We forgot George Washington's warning about entangling alliances. We went to war. We acquired outside territory. At the end of the World War period, as a direct result of our fiddling in international affairs, our national debt had jumped to over $25 billion. Our total favorable trade balance during the 25 year period was about $24 billion. Therefore, on a purely bookkeeping basis, we ran a little behind year for year, and then foreign trade might well have been ours without the wars. It would have been far cheaper, not to say safer, for the Amer average American who pays the bills to stay out of foreign entanglements. For a very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits. The cost of operations is always transferred to the people who do not profit. And he goes into a chapter called Who Makes the Profits? The World War, rather our brief participation in it, has cost the United States some $52 billion. Figure it out. That means $400 for every man, woman, and child in America. We haven't paid the debt yet. We are paying it. Our children were paying it. And our children's children will probably still be paying the cost of that war. And then he goes through how the normal profits of a business concern in the United States are 6, 8, 10, sometimes 12%. But wartime profits, ah, that is another matter. 20, 60, 100, 300, even 1,800%. The sky is the limit. All that the traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. And then he goes through uh, issue after issue. People after, he starts out with the, take our friend the DuPonts. You know? And he goes through how much profit all these different groups and all these different people are making and the horrors of it and who pays the bill, how it's basically you and me. And then finally, chapter four, how to smash this racket. Well, it's a racket, all right. A, pre, a few profit and the many pay but there is a way to stop it. You can't end it by disarmament conflicts, flicks, uh, conferences. You can't eliminate it by peace parlays at Geneva. Well-meaning but impractical groups can't wipe it out by resolutions. It can only be smashed effectively by taking the profit 
out of war. The only way to smash this racket is to conscript capital and industry and labor before the nation's manhood can be conscripted. Now, think of this. I, you know, this idea had not even occurred to me before I read Smedley Butler. He's saying draft businessmen and women, draft their businesses, and then finally draft the soldiers. He says one month before the government can conscript, in other words, draft, the young men of the nation, it must conscript capital and industry and labor. Let the officers and directors and the high-powered executives of our armament factories and our munition makers and our shipbuilders and our airplane builders and the manufacturers of all the other things that provide profit in wartime, as well as the bank bankers and speculators, be conscripted to get a $30 a month paycheck, the same wage as the lads in the trenches get. In other words, when we go to war, all the defense contractors, all their executives, they get paid the same as a private. Let the workers in these plants get the same wages. All the workers, all presidents, all executives, all directors, all managers, all bankers. Yes, and all generals and all admirals and all officers and all politicians and all government office holders. Everyone in the nation be restricted to a total monthly income, not to exceed that paid to the soldier in the trenches. Let all these kings and tycoons and masters of business and all those workers in industry and all our senators and governors and majors pay half of their monthly $30 wage to their families and pay war risk insurance and buy liberty bonds with the other half. Why shouldn't they? They aren't running any risk of being killed or of having their bodies mangled or their minds shattered. They aren't sleeping in muddy trenches. They aren't hungry. The soldiers are. Give capital and industry and labor 30 days to think it over, and you will find that by that time, there will be no war. They will smash the war racket, that and nothing else. Maybe I'm a little too optimistic. Capital still has some say, so capital won't permit the talk the taking of the profit out of war until the people, those who do the suffering and still pay the price, until the people make up their minds that those they elect to office shall do their bidding and not that of the war profiteers. Another step necessary in this fight to smash the war racket is the limited plebiscite to determine whether a war should be declared. In other words, an election. A plebiscite not of all the voters, but merely of those who would be called upon to do the fighting and the dying. There wouldn't be very much sense in having a 76-year-old president of a munitions factory or the flat-footed head of an international banking firm or the cross-eyed manager of a uniform manufacturing plant, all of whom see visions of tremendous profits in the event of war, voting on whether the nation should go to war or not. They never would be called upon to shoulder arms, to sleep in a trench, to be shot. Only those who would be called upon to risk their lives for their country should have the privilege of voting to determine whether the nation should go to war. There's ample precedent for restricting the voting to those affected. Many of our states have restrictions on those permitted to vote. In most, it's necessary to be able to read and write before you vote. Keep in mind, this was 1935. In some, you must own property. It would be a simple matter each year for the men coming to military age to register in their communities as they did in the draft during the World War and be examined physically. Those who could pass and who would therefore be called upon to bear arms in the event of war would be eligible to vote in this limited plebiscite, this limited election about whether or not we should go to war. They should be the ones to have the power to decide and not a Congress few who of, of whose members are within the age limit and fewer still of whom are in physical condition to bear arms. Only those who must suffer should have the right to vote on whether or not to go to war. A third step in this business of smashing the war racket is to make sure that our military forces are truly forces for defense only. At each session of Congress, the question of further naval appropriations come up. The swivel chair admirals of Washington, and there are always a lot of them, are very adroit lobbyists, and they are smart. They don't shout that we need a lot more battleships to war on this nation or that nation. Oh, no. First of all, they let it be known that America is menaced by a great naval power. You're listening to Tom Hartman. The electoral college started, you know, I know uh, back in uh, Washington's time. And if democracy is supposed to evolve with the people, then the reason why they had the electoral college, that reason doesn't exist anymore. Right. It was to increase the power and influence of the slave states because they had such small white populations. And and uh, I agree with you. The problem is it's written into the Constitution, which means it's going to take a constitutional amendment to get it out. Until we get rid of voter suppression and the Electoral College, uh, we can never really have a, a true de democratic uh, 
uh, election. Agreed. A small D. Agreed. You, know. you, Agreed. you can never have a real, because if the, if the person is only after the electoral college votes, which I, I, I felt is what uh, Trump and them did, yeah. then they'll they're, they're, they're hone their campaign just to get those votes and that's it. And they won't care about nothing else. Right. Oh, you know, what just occurred to me, Maine, is there is another strategy to get rid of the Electoral College, and that is by having states join on to the national popular vote referendum. Uh, the national popular vote thing, um, when when states representing, what is it, 274 electoral votes all sign on to this, then all of these states are going to commit that whatever, whatever the, the popular vote is, they're going to go with that. And yeah. and so, you know, rather than just the Electoral College. So if it, but the problem is that all the most of the Democratic states have signed on with this, but the Republican states have not. They're refusing to do it. So, I mean, they like the Electoral College. Uh, you know, back in the day, they probably liked slavery. I mean, it's just the, the, you know, this is the plantation mentality. Maine, thanks a lot for the call. Excellent points, Paul. You're listening to the Tom Hartman program. Listen, New York will go what? Yeah. But if we could hand count the ballots in Hey, if they states. can do it in Germany and England, if we can do it here. It's not, it's, I mean, hey, if we did it here for 200 years, we could still do it here. Norma, thank you. Spot on. We'll be right back. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives.